Are the Russians being framed for something they didn't do? Because that's what they say is happening. No, that's outrageous. Uh, that's just typical denial, deception. We know the facts. Um, the fact is that a laboratory in Germany, a very sophisticated uh, military laboratory, was able to confirm not just that chemical weapons were used in this the heinous attack against the opposition figure, uh, Navalny, but a very specific, special kind of chemical weapon called Novichok that is only available in a, illegally uh, available in a very tightly secured Russian military supported uh, laboratory. Hi everyone, and welcome to Backstory. And I'm Dana Lewis in London, the host and creator of this podcast. And on this Backstory, Russia, the poison and the consequences. You probably don't know why President Ronald Reagan once called the Soviets the evil empire, but it was because of massive biological and chemical weapons programs aimed at the West. The military doctrine included bombing America and Western Europe with things like anthrax and tularemia and smallpox after a nuclear exchange. They even had a weaponized agricultural program to wipe out crops in the West so no food would grow. When the Soviet Union collapsed, much of that heinous arsenal was exposed and destroyed. But not all of it. And that's why the 2018 deployment of a nerve agent in Salisbury, England, against a former Russian military intelligence agent, Sergei Skripal, and now the use of the same nerve agent against an opposition figure in Russia, has alarmed the West as never before. The nerve agent is called Novichok, and Russia won't get away with denials this time. Here's NATO's Secretary General, Jen Stoltenberg. Russia now has serious questions it must answer. The Russian government must fully cooperate with the organization for the prohibition of chemical weapons on an impartial international investigation. Those responsible for this attack must be held accountable and brought to justice. Use of chemical nerve agents by a state crosses too many red lines for too many people. In this backstory, we speak with one of the foremost American experts on chemical biological programs created during the Soviet Union, secrets still kept by Russia. And later, an interview with a Russia expert who says, the Kremlin is now more dangerous and more aggressive. We are, she says, in a new phase of Russian operations that have to be met head-on by Western nations. Andy Weber was the Assistant Secretary of Defense, whose area of responsibility are U.S. nuclear, chemical, and biological defense programs. And I'm smiling when I say this because it is a huge amount of responsibility. I mean, just one of those portfolios would be enough. Well, I used to say we had the luxury of just focusing on, on three things only, uh, nuclear, chemical, and biological. And, and that was a great privilege to serve in that job under President Obama's administration. Does the U.S. have any chemical weapons or nerve agents left? Well, we're at the very tail end of destroying our entire Cold War arsenal in a safe manner under organization of prohibition of chemical weapons supervision. Why is that, why is that so important? I mean, th these things were meant to kind of match the enemy. And then at a certain point, there was a shift in, in thinking where people said strategically, you know what, we don't want these in our arsenals at all. What happened? Well, the Cold War ended in short. I mean, the horror of World War I and the use of chemical weapons led to a, a, the Geneva Convention. And then as the Soviet Union was collapsing, uh, we negotiated and finalized the Chemical Weapons Convention, which banned all chemical weapons and had a very specific series of steps for countries that had chemical weapons to destroy them in a verifiable, permanent way. So uh, it, it's been very, very successful uh, until recently uh, when we saw uh, massive violations by the Syrian regime and then these two recent uh, attacks in 2018 and uh, last week, uh, the use of a very sophisticated uh, military chemical weapon uh, called the Novichok uh, agents in assassinations. 
So let's talk Russia and Novichok. It's been identified as the substance given to the opposition figure, Alexei Navalny. Are the Russians being framed for something they didn't do? Because that's what they say is happening. No, that's outrageous. Uh, that's just typical denial, deception. We know the facts. Um, the fact is that a laboratory in Germany, a very sophisticated uh, military laboratory, was able to confirm not just that chemical weapons were used in this the heinous attack against the opposition figure, uh, Navalny, but a very specific, special kind of chemical weapon called Novichok that is only available in a, illegally uh, available in a very tightly secured Russian military supported uh, laboratory. Are they supposed to have it at all? No, they're definitely not supposed to have it. This is a banned chemical weapon. And the fact that they have it is very worrisome because they could use it not just to kill one person, but they could use it in a much larger uh, mass attack. For example, that little perfume bottle that was found in the dumpster in Salisbury that was used in the assassination attempt against uh, Sergei Skripal had over 10,000 lethal doses. So those two covert agents, uh, somewhat hapless covert agents from the GRU who mounted that attack in Salisbury, could have killed uh, thousands of people. And just as a footnote to that, Andy, a lot of people don't realize that after the scripples were poisoned, then uh, a lady came along and found the perfume bottle and and uh, and uh, took some of the Novichok out, not realizing what it was, and she died. So she was an yeah. innocent, innocent victim in that. Apparently so she, her... Her husband was a dumpster diver and gave it to her as a gift, and she sprayed it on her wrists and killed herself. So why shouldn't the the um, Organization for the Prohibition of Chemical Weapons, the OPCW, have the right to see the Russian program and inspect it? Because Russia is a signatory at, to the Chemical Weapons Convention. Well, they did oversee the destruction of 40,000 tons of Russia's declared chemical weapons stockpile. And that was very, very successful. That effort was supported by the United States through the Nunn Luger program. Um, we invested over a billion dollars to help the Russians destroy that massive Cold War stockpile. But these smaller covert illegal stocks are not declared as they should be by the Russian Federation government. So there's really nothing um, the OPCW can do about that unless they're invited in uh, by the uh, member state, in this case, the Russian Federation, to launch an investigation of this uh, use, illegal use of chemical weapons last week. One of the reasons Russia is never going to admit this, um, among others, because if they admit that they have Novichok, then that's it. They're going to have to open the door to international inspections. Yeah, th they'll never in a million years admit it. And I'm convinced that they were certain that they would not get caught especially doing this inside of Russia. Why are you certain? I mean, Novichok can be identified by, you know, the Brits use Porton Down, their military lab, the Germans have their own labs. Why do you, why do you, you think that they just never thought that Navalny would leave the country, but in the end, the Kremlin let him leave the country? Yeah, no, they screwed it up. They thought they would uh, quickly kill him and he would, he would be buried in Russia and, and the world would never be wiser. But because of the pressure to release him, their failure to kill him, uh, and his release to a uh, hospital in Berlin, that allowed the Germans to bring samples to a very, very sophisticated laboratory that was able to determine the precise cause of his uh, grave illness. You know, you alluded to it a, a couple of minutes ago, but people don't realize the work that you've spent your life doing and others in the threat reduction programs that the former Soviet Union had ridiculous amounts of biological and chemical weapons. And after the collapse of the Soviet Union, then they started to open their program. Um, you, you helped spearhead some of the programs where scientists were even retrained so that they wouldn't you know, go and sell their evil ways to terrorist organizations. I mean, people don't realize that history, even though it's not, it's not very far behind us. Well, you don't get credit for preventing a catastrophe. It's what didn't happen that's important in this case. Thanks to the vision of Senator uh, Nunn and the late Senator Luger, 
Um, the United States, through the Department of Defense Cooperative Threat Reduction Program, invested heavily along with its European partners in helping Russia and the other former Soviet states, the newly independent states in the 90s, get rid of the legacy of their weapons of mass destruction. This was a decades-long effort that cost billions of dollars and it was very, very successful because those weapons and materials and expertise did not fall into the hands of terrorists and rogue states like North Korea. So is chemical biological warfare programs a thing of the past or of the future? Well, I worry very much. They need to be a thing of the past. Uh, as President Obama said when he was in office, we can't let the, uh, the worst weapons of the 20th century darken the 21st century. We have uh, a, a global prohibition on, on chemical weapons, uh, the Chemical Weapons Convention. And unfortunately, it's weakening the norm of use the taboo against use of chemical weapons seems to be breaking down as countries like Russia and North Korea have flagrantly violated in these three assassinations and assassination attempts. The, um, the world needs to redouble our efforts to get rid of all chemical weapons and same with you, biological weapons. How do you stop it? Like, I mean, how do you deal with Russia when th they have essentially this propaganda line every single time, look surprised, act concerned, and deny everything? Well, we use the truth. We use the truth. We use uh, neutral OPCW laboratories to make these judgments, and we play it to the Russian public. And over time, they should be ashamed, and they won't uh, support a regime that continues to violate these critical international norms of which Russia is one of the founding partners. And yet your president has just come out on the weekend and said he didn't see any proof that Alexei Navalny was poisoned. Um, he said it was tragic, but, you know, he said we should be worried about China. Forget about Russia. Well, this fits a pattern. He's been consistently a shameful apologist for the worst uh, excesses of the Putin regime. We live in a time of COVID-19, so-called natural outbreak of a virus, but clearly there are some lessons to be learned about preparing for the moment that someone deploys chemical or biological weapons against a Western nation or city. Well, as bad as this pandemic is, and it's, it's horrible, and uh, you know, here in the United States, we're suffering terribly because of uh, poor leadership. But the truth is a, an attack with biological weapons uh, could be much worse than what we're experiencing today. So I worry that the impact of this naturally occurring virus um, is sending a message to our adversaries that if we want to hurt the United States and its allies, we should pursue illegal banned biological weapons. So what's the counter message? Because if you want to cripple the American economy... If, if you want to even uh, hurt the military of the United States, you deploy a chemical or biological weapon, and, and, and these weapons are far more lethal than COVID-19, um, what, what's the message back? How do you fight well, it? How do you identify well, even who deployed it? What we need is a, is a global effort um, led by the United States. Remember U.S. leadership? Uh, I, was involved I, in the Ebola, I was involved in the Ebola response when President Obama mobilized over 70 countries to contribute to that effort, a very successful effort to stamp out Ebola in West Africa in 2014 and 15. So what we need is, and, and the Council on Strategic Risks, where I serve as a senior fellow, has been working for over a year on an effort to make bioweapons obsolete. We are confident that with uh, the breakthrough in technologies and the revolution in biology, with a sustained high-level effort led by the President of the United States, we can make this whole class of, of biological weapons obsolete. And how do you do that? Sorry, forgive me, but well, I... what we need is a is a global early warning system for early detection of, of outbreaks as early as the first patient who's exposed. We can sequence the viruses and bacteria, the pathogens that circulate 
around the world and actually map them real time now. We have technology to do that. And then what we're seeing deployed today are these rapid reaction medical countermeasures that were developed by the US military. The sequence was posted by China on the 11th of January of the coronavirus. And within days, we had a prototype vaccine and a prototype treatment for uh, COVID-19. So while it's taking uh, a little more time, because this is the first experience we have actually using these modern nucleic acid vaccines and antibodies um, uh, in people, once they're proven safe and effective, and we're, we're just weeks away from that, um, it will give us a rapid reaction capability that I'm convinced will convince our adversaries that it's not worth using biological weapons because they won't be effective. But it's going to take a sustained effort, a public-private partnership, to really invest in the defenses against all uh, biological weapons and naturally occurring infectious disease so we don't have pandemics in the future. Didn't we just see a defense uh, program cut to the biological program? Yeah, inexplicably, uh, President Trump and Secretary of Defense Mark Esper in their budget request this year cut the Department of Defense chemical and biological defense program nearly 10%. Now, of course, they did this in uh, February just as the coronavirus was taking hold in the world. It was a, a, a stupid move, and uh, my hope is that the next administration will vastly increase our efforts in chemical and biological defenses. Well, the next administration may be the same administration. And, uh, you know, do you think that they'll rethink that budget cut now that they're far into this pandemic and they're seeing just how devastating it is to especially America? I can't imagine that they would not rethink that boneheaded decision. Um, clearly, anybody who's experiencing this terrible loss of life is going to realize that we need to increase our investments in the medical countermeasures against bio biological threats, whether they are uh, engineered by a state biological weapons program or naturally occurring. I just want to circle back to the question I asked you before, because I was a little unclear about the, the answer. But Russia will deny, um, and they'll continue to deny, and they'll be mounting evidence in the investigation that, you know, I think we're already there anyway, that the Novichok doesn't roll around. You can't buy it at the pharmacy in Russia. The only people that would have it are state agencies and state actors and, and you know, uh, FSB or the GRU. Uh, um, so what happens? I mean, do we do we just do we do sanctions? Do do we get tougher with Russia? Or I mean, how do we stop this from happening again? Because this is one in a series now. Well, Russia will deny, confuse, and obfuscate, and come up with all kinds of crazy stories explaining this uh, simple uh, attack. And what you described, because this is a very tightly guarded chemical weapons agent, only in the hands of the Russian state. We now have what well, we controvertible. Hope. We hope. Well, I, I'm confident that this is not uh, something that's floating around on the black market. Um, the conditions you need to store it and, and handle it properly are very sophisticated, and there's no reason that the Russians wouldn't place the highest uh, security around uh, any small stockpile of this. Uh, very dangerous chemical weaponization. So it's so damning because it can only come from the Russian government. So this was an attack by Russian security service personnel against one of its own citizens. And we, that's the only plausible explanation. So we need to continue to investigate as we can. I mean, there were people on the airplane at the airport and hopefully the story will get out over time. But the most damning evidence of all is in Navalny's uh, blood and his system. And uh, the analysis of, of the chemistry of those samples proved with high confidence that a Novichok chemical weapon was used in this case. What's the penalty? 
for doing well, that, for deploying in a spe- peacetime, in wartime, it doesn't matter. I was going to say in peacetime, but in well, any time, what should be what should be the 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 check that should come due for doing something that everybody thought was unthinkable? Germany and our NATO allies, the United States, need to band together and make Russia pay a price for this. We can't let them get away again uh, with impunity. And whether it's canceling the Northeast uh, pipeline, which is almost completed, or some other uh, sanction, we need to send the message. Because Putin will continue to do this, as you know he has, uh, unless he has to pay a cost, unless he's convinced that the, the West will stand up to this and that the costs of such um, outrageous actions will be greater than um, the risks of not engaging in these uh, terrible, terrible attacks, in this case against an opposition figure. Andy Weber is former Assistant Secretary for Defense of Nuclear, Chemical, and Biological Defense Programs. It's always an honor to talk to you. Thanks, Andy. Thank you, Dana. Maria Snegovaya from the Center for European Policy Analysis, and she's also at Virginia Tech, joins us now from Washington. Hi, Maria. Hello, Dana. Maria is a brilliant analyst, and, and I think you've just written really a terrific, insightful piece for Newsweek. Congratulations. Thank you. It's very interesting because a lot of the take on Alexei Navalny and the poisoning has been, well, Russia's done it before, they've done it again. And you say that Putin's regime, quote, because I'm stealing your words now, is transforming into a new, more repressive type of dictatorship than before, that this transformation is manifest an intensified wave of repression against opposition politicians and opinion leaders, unprecedented even by Russia's own standards. Why is it unprecedented? In what way? After the constitutional amendments have been passed uh, this July, uh, the regime really seems to have um, embraced some sense of impunity. Uh, there was essentially, uh, Putin has extended his uh, stay in power for at least 12 more years de jure, uh, de facto almost indefinitely now, uh, because the amendments were passed uh, in complete violations of any uh, rules and laws, whatever. And you existed. know, while people were dealing with the pandemic and, and, and COVID-19 in Europe and in America, there was a referendum and he's now extended his term until 2036. And there were all sorts of voting irregularities on a massive, massive scale. So, yeah, absolutely. It's understandable why this happened. So uh, the, the moment uh, was chosen right, uh, correctly, and uh, the regime uh, and Putin himself is quite good in picking moments. For example, he uh, started uh, the 2008 uh, war in Georgia, uh, was started by the Kremlin uh, during the uh, Olympic Games, right, again, to distract the attention. And similarly, something similar has happened in Ukraine as well. Uh, so in this sense, uh, um, the, the way these amendments have been passed and the very uh, little response and resistance they have, these changes have received from uh, Russian population domestically and from the international community uh, seems to have uh, shifted something in the perception of the reality by the Kremlin. And yes, of course, uh, it's not it the first time. It seems to have shifted something in the, re- in the perception of reality by the Kremlin. What does that mean? Uh, they just uh, think they're now convinced that uh, at least up until the poison mm-hmm. of Alme, it seems that... Um, uh, they become convinced that they can do anything with very little repercussions and uh, consequences. Uh, and it's true, as I said, essentially, they are now in power forever. So who is to stop them, to stop them from doing what they want to, right? Is it the, the West that's divided, polarized, and weakened by its own uh, internal um, fra- uh, fractures? Or is it a domestic Russian population that's repressed, uh, fearful, also, by the way, heavily prosecuted with the fines? Uh, Navalny team, for example, still repaying the fines they've been charged with last year when the uh, large um, mass protests erupted in Moscow um, uh, last summer. So in this sense, uh, yeah, they seem to be feeling uh, the same. And of course, as with any thug, if uh, a thug goes unpunished, uh, you know, 
for a while, uh, then a thug becomes emboldened. And unfortunately, the current Kremlin elites, they do have this thuggish, thuggish mentality. They, it's been uh, said uh, before. Uh, so what's new about Navalny, just to answer your question, right? It's true that unfortunately, the Kremlin's critics and opponents have been uh, killed in, before. Uh, the most notorious example is the shooting on Boris Nemtsov um, uh, in 2015, uh, one of the opposition leaders as well. Uh, but, I knew uh, Boris Nemtsov, and for people that don't know, no, Boris Nemtsov, he was, a, he was an amazing man. He was deputy prime minister at one point uh, in Russia under Yeltsin, and then he became an opposition leader because he felt democracy was crumbling in Russia, and he, he ran for mayor in Sochi. He did many, many different things, but, and he, he opposed the invasion of Ukraine and Russia's seizure of Crimea, but he was shot multiple times in front of the Kremlin, in front of video cameras that just were conveniently switched off by the Kremlin that night. Yeah, what an accident, right? <laughs> All the cameras switched off. Um, and uh, it's true. And the great thing, by the way, about Boris, who I also knew, is uh, essentially he was, uh, he had power, he had access, right? He potentially had a possibility to live quite nicely under this regime because he had connections on the very top. And he, he decided uh, willfully to abandon all of that uh, for the sake of, uh, you know, future democratic Russia as he imagined it to be. Uh, that is something that very few people are uh, able to do, unfortunately, in Russia. Um, Navalny is another example of very um, um, courageous, brave man. Uh, but the difference here, at least the way it's perceived in Russia, is that at least uh, with Nemtsov's murder, there was certain uh, confusion about who exactly ordered it. Um, uh, we suspect uh, that uh, the connections go up to uh, Ramzan Kadyrov, uh, the leader of Chechen Republic. Uh, but to what extent Putin himself like, personally wanted that is a little bit questionable. There were all kinds of theories. But some that... people have drawn parallels with that. They've said, you know, in Putin's Russia now, um, people sometimes will act in Putin's interest, not necessarily with Putin's blessing. But you think in this case of Navalny, absolutely he would have had to verbally pull the trigger and say and, yes. And the reason is, uh, the reason is, um, uh, the, the proof in my eyes is the fact that Navalny has re remained relatively in June, relatively, it's important to highlight, for a decade, right? He's been quite uh, dangerous and annoying uh, to the Kremlin for quite a while. Uh, Navalny is probably the most effective uh, political leader in Russia uh, over um, uh, the Russia's recent history. He's been able to create the whole chain of um, his uh, offices throughout Russia uh, without being officially allowed into Russia's political system, which is absolutely amazing. His um, corruption investigation are extremely popular. His media media resource is one of the uh, highest among Russia's public. Uh, figures and personalities mm -hmm. and uh, of course his smart voting campaign uh, uh, was very successful as back in 2011. But why now? Uh, uh, right now, uh, by the why way, now? Why now? Why was he uh, murdered now? Yeah, and by the way, last thing that implicates Kremlin is, of course, the use of Novichok. Uh, this is uh, the sort of substance that can only be elaborated at the very top level with access. The very few uh, officials have access to it. So why now? Um, I think that's precisely the constitutional amendments and the overall sort of apathy that has spread uh, in the Russian society. Notice how even Navalny's poisoning again, quite unprecedented even by Russia's own standards, has not uh, led Russians in the streets. Uh, so there's, it's important to keep in mind that the, the, the Kremlin banned uh, mass protest under pretext of the pandemic and public health. Uh, and there's also huge fines um, that follow um, if uh, people violate uh, uh, these regulations. As I, as I mentioned before, back in 2019, the fines were huge and a lot of opposition leaders still have to repay uh, those. And uh, so I think they realize that it's a perfect moment and the Russian uh, society seems to again be, become uh, less interested in politics, d d d d disengaged, and um, uh, the West uh, is also distracted. And of course, there's also a fear of something like Belarus uh, happening in Russia, because of course, Russians watch Belarus. Belarus I was going to ask you, I mean, clearly a lot of people are saying that the street is on fire in Belarus against Lukashenko. The Kremlin shudders, worrying about that spreading, and and Alexei Navalny would be potentially the one to to set the match and and uh, and and yeah. get it going in Russia. 
uh, Navalny has developed a smart voting strategy that worked really nicely last year in Moscow Duma election. Uh, the idea is that uh, to get the protest vo vo uh, vote united against the strongest candidate who runs against the Kremlin candidate. And uh, in 2019 Moscow uh, elections last year, even if many independent uh, candidates were not allowed to run uh, by the Kremlin, still the position, thanks to Navalny, managed to unite uh, around the alternative candidates and they almost these alternative candidates backed by Navalny's campaign took almost half of Moscow Duma this has not happened in the past and was a really big blow uh, to Putin and the Kremlin because a lot of Kremlin backed very important people negotiated on the very top failed uh, to make it into the Duma to make it into the Duma so the elections are not free and fair Duma, by any Russian state. parliament for people that don't the, know. the Moscow yeah the Moscow problem although the Moscow level or the Moscow, Moscow region level. Level. Uh, so in this uh, this year, on September 13, Russia holds another round of elections countrywide, and Navalny team has been working very actively to spread this Moscow success in other regions, especially in Novosibirsk, uh, which is the third most important, so the third largest city in Moscow. But Navalny's teammates, uh, like Vladimir Milov, say that what even more important is that right now Navalny has been really testing the strategy ahead of Moscow Duma election. This is the federal uh, level parliamentary elections that are scheduled to uh, be, take place in 2021. Uh, maybe they will be scheduled a little bit earlier. And the Kremlin is really afraid that if Navalny is successfully able to mobilize people in the regions, and he already showed that he's successful in Moscow, uh, this can turn out very bad uh, for the Kremlin. So, given that this is a perfect moment where the population is uh, um, quite, as I said, disengaged politically, everyone is repressed and afraid of fines, and the constitutional amendments essentially now allow Putin to stay in power indefinitely, this is a perfect pretext, you know, to implement all kind of uh, uh, bad repressions against uh, uh, the Kremlin's political opponents. Navalny, by the way, is not just the only person who is currently, who has suffered under this wave of repressions. This is just the most notorious example, but there's also a number of Navalny's teammates who are beaten, beaten up and uh, um, uh, attacked uh, in Russia's regions. Uh, today there was a news about an, atta an attack on independent candidates who run um, in municipal uh, elections as well. There's also increased charges. Uh, some of the uh, opposition candidates face um, uh, criminal charges for organizing an independent opposition rally. So it's just uh, the, the wave of repressions has definitely escalated in August. It's very visible. If you're a repressive regime, and you have this great psychological sense of an inf invincibility now that you, you talk about, uh, why doesn't this work? And why not just continue and, and do more? And it will grow unless what? Well, I think what is very encouraging, a small, uh, you know, beam of light in this darkness is the response of the international community. Somehow the response has been less pronounced in the case of Belarus than I hoped. But Navalny's poisoning seems to sort of kind of hit some kind of trigger. And we are really right now uh, hearing an unprecedented statement uh, by uh, world leaders like Angela Merkel, G7, uh, just earlier today, really issued a very powerful announcement. Even uh, Francois Macron, who tried to be friends with Putin, uh, now has to, uh, you know, refrain. And it seems to be that, it seems that certain type of international joint action is inevitable in this sense. So that's so my that, that may be strange. sanctions, but you know what my next question is going to be. Yeah, the well, sanctions don't work, don't work, do they? <laughs> <laughs> my next question is going to be, with all this condemnation, condemnation, President Trump, uh, the most powerful country, has been completely absent from this, and he has refused to condemn Putin. Um, and a lot of people think that it's just unbelievable that, I mean, there have been some statements from other people in the U.S. Uh, administration, but President Trump has not come out and condemned the poisoning of Navalny and demanded really much of anything from President Putin. He said we should be more worried about China right now. Unfortunately, it's typical of, for President Trump. He always sort of uh, uh, switches um, his record, try to shift the rhetoric away from Russia onto China. Why is that? Also, because he's got an election and he needs Russia's help in the election? <laughs> so a lot of people, of course, have been uh, pointing out this possible uh, some kind of affinity of Trump's uh, to Putin. Rhetorically, it certainly looks this way because uh, Trump really has been 
amazingly reluctant to in any way condemn uh, Putin's regime. Uh, but I have to say that, uh, uh, first of all, Pompeo did come out with a sort of a statement, right? Second of all, um, if you look at the policies by Trump administration, maybe that's not his own credit, but the policies against Putin has been more or less um, unified with the EU response in recent years. I have looked at that uh, in depth. Uh, there, were, uh, heavy, uh, there were consequences after Skripal uh, was poisoned. Uh, for example, there were heavy sanctions on Tiripaska, uh, remember, which actually crushed uh, the Russian market, uh, which were later lifted, unfortunately, but at the time uh, they were quite uh, significant. Uh, right, but uh, the Magnitsky, also... Bill Browder's Magnitsky Act was passed in the US. It was passed in Canada. It's been passed now by Britain. Browder is saying, okay, this is the moment that the EU has to, to pass it now. Because if you don't increase sanctions against Russia, then quote unquote, as Browder uh, put it in a tweet, that Putin thinks he has a license to kill. That's absolutely true. And uh, just to, uh, to fa finish my last discussion, I think that uh, uh, while Trump actually follows somewhat uh, uh, the um, uh, sanctions policy that's also um, imposed by the EU, uh, the effort there is actually to try probably to steal the hope to probably to negotiate with Russia against China. Uh, they probably afraid to push uh, Putin, um, um, you know, too much into China's hands. I think it's a little bit too late for it. I think uh, Putin and the Kremlin is right now uh, definitely uh, negotiating with China because they understand that they're not going to be able to survive in power without certain type of uh, Chinese uh, help. Uh, long term. So that's uh, that's done uh, the deal. On uh, the individual uh, sanctions list, yes, absolutely true. It's uh, uh, Bill Browder is absolutely correct. We need uh, more sanctions and uh, there was an op-ed um, in uh, uh, New York Times recently that actually suggested to do something by like Navalny's list, uh, similar to Magnitsky's list, uh, uh, the op-ed written by Brett uh, Stevenson. That's all great, but I have to say that individual sanctions are important, but they're not what's going to uh, fundamentally damage Putin's regime. The so very it's fact fundamentally going to damage, damage the regime, if that's the goal. Well, if that's the goal, of course, we need to, and by the way, that's the reason why uh, the sanctions have not been that, that effective in the first place up until now, right? Because they were never very strong. And, uh, the sanctions that were imposed in Russia were relatively uh, soft, with certain uh, exceptions, but which didn't last for long. What we need is strong uh, sectoral uh, sanctions and broader, more um, stronger sanctions of Iranian type. Uh, so this some kind of developments on the German side uh, and statements by Merkel and her uh, closest officials that say that this might mean the end of Nord Stream 2, this is going to be painful. Nord Stream uh, 2 but, is a very long pipeline that is supposed to be 90% complete between Russia and Germany. And has been frozen uh, by a round of uh, the US sanctions, by the way, in December 2019. Uh, and but it's not uh, the, over uh, yet. And lately, Germany, that always been very supportive of this project, suddenly even German officials started saying that maybe uh, Navalny poisoning is what's going to. And if it's not investigated, if there's no cooperation on the Kremlin side, maybe it will be the end of this project. This will be more painful. So individual sanctions are needed, but it's not at all uh, yeah. what's needed. But then I, again, I, we... I know I don't have unlimited time with you, and I do want to ask you about Belarus. Of course. Um, does, does some of this, do you think, we, we've already talked about the fact that Putin may have done this because he's worried about the problems in Belarus, in Belarus uh, spreading to, to Russia uh, and that the protests could spread and Navalny could be the driver of some of that. Um, I have to say, look, we are weeks and weeks into, you know, more than a month into Lukashenko's fraudulent uh, election and then his locking up and beating of people and torturing of people, it just seems to go from bad to worse. And now you have this Maria Kaselnikova, you can correct my pronunciation, but she's one of the main opposition leaders. She disappeared. She was snatched off the street. I mean, he's snatching people off the street, yeah. peaceful demonstrators. She has now been charged by the KGB after she wouldn't go to Ukraine. She wouldn't run from the country. She ripped up her passport. She has now been charged with trying to overthrow the government. I mean, it goes from bad to worse. 
Well, absolutely true. Unfortunately, uh, Lukashenko's regime is even more brutal and repressive than the current regime in Russia. The, this sort of repressions have been in place before, and which, if anything, only more highlights the incredible courage and commitment of Belarusian people who uh, stay in the streets, who continue right to protest uh, despite all these brutal oppressions and the risks that they're facing, they're really mortal uh, risks. And honestly, in my mind, I'm not, uh, I'm convinced that Lukashenko will not stop at anything. Like, like Putin, he understands that to him, living his throne is a, a direct path to Gaga, to Hague, right? To, to essentially to uh, criminal justice uh, and to, to ultimately to jail. And these uh, leaders, therefore, uh, will stay anything, st do anything in their power to um, to stay, uh, to stay, uh, because the risks are really. Uh, Did you uh, see his his recent interview with Russian media, all very nicely staged? But um, he said that Belarus mm -hmm. uh, Belarus has strengthened the protection of state border in all directions except for Russia, because of course he's courting Putin right now. Men hide behind women and children, like 75 years ago when the Nazis let women go ahead, protests are controlled by USA, Poland, Czech Republic, Ukraine, and Lithuania. Is, well, that's, is that just good propaganda, or or is he? Of mad? course, and he and he's also he is uh, saying anything in his power, right? Uh, we on Russia's Twitter, there are already bets being made. Who is he going to accuse next? Everyone's waiting for Soros to be accused at some point. You know, Soros is this famous. Uh, um, uh, men, uh, person who has funded a lot of great initiatives in, in Europe, in this year, but also treated, treated by local autocrats as the big, uh, big uh, conspiracy figure behind any protests. Uh, and uh, yeah, Lukashenko is off the rail at this point. He has nothing to lose. He definitely tried to side with Putin. Uh, he also tries to please Putin with, in all his might, remember his so-called leaked conversation between Mike and Nick, uh, allegedly American uh, security service officers who describe how to best to essentially back protesters and in Belarus and against right, Russia. Again, suggesting this is all controlled from the outside and the protesters are, are Typical narratives. And, yeah. Typical autocratic narratives about this color revolution uh, allegedly inspired from People don't outside. seem to be buying it though, Maria, in what? Belarus. They don't seem to be buying it. I mean, they're out in big numbers every single weekend and they are not being intimidated by him. It seems That's like the... Amazing. I mean, it seems like they understand they were ripped off in the election and oh, that's, that's it, uh, they're done with him. So how does that end? Amazing. This is a very good question. And first of all, I have to say that the reason why uh, Lukashenko is so emboldened and why is he so unconstrained and unhinged is, uh, as I said before, the very weak response of the Western community. Unfortunately, the West is in a trap somewhat. They're very much afraid to provoke Putin in the way that happened in Ukraine. So if they were to help protesters, they're afraid this actually is going to, if anything, trigger Putin to um, uh, move his uh, uh, military into Belarus. Uh, but at the same time, it's also hard to stay and watch at this de facto genocide that's uh, uh, Lukashenko uh, implementing against his own people. And uh, genocide is a pretty tough word. It's a very strong word, but again, people were brutally uh, killed and uh, murdered, right? There's people who were disappe who disappeared. And there's no question that once Lukashenko feels more confident, they they uh, they uh, huge repressions are going to follow against uh, Belarusian people. And uh, the response of the international community has been uh, remarkably weak. Uh, the EU e even refrained from sanctioning Lukashenko himself under the pretext that they still need to negotiate uh, with him. Uh, so at least sanctions but need the to If the EU, be and I'm sorry to jump in again, if the EU does not get tough on this guy, they have lost the plot, surely. They are uh, asking, uh, oh, to your question, what's going to happen? Yeah, I think right now uh, Putin is going to back uh, Lukashenko. Putin is also wary of a possible example that any removal of Lukashenko right now may give to Russian people uh, who, uh, as we have discussed, are also increasingly happy with Russia domestically. There's also protests spreading in Russia. For example, there's a huge protest ongoing for a month in Khabarovsk region. That's in the Far um, East, yeah. In this sense, I think right now replacing Lukashenko uh, would just give serve an example that a pro democratic protest can succeed. Putin is definitely not ready uh, to do anything like that. In the long term, however, I think the vast and popularity of Lukashenko may uh, uh, may incentivize may, may essentially give 
Putin to lead some incentives to replace him and with a more Lukashenko with a more acceptable figure. But overall, the main, uh, however, the main outcome for Putin right now is definitely a success. Uh, Putin will use this as a pretext to deepen the Belarus-Russian Union, which also allegedly will allow Putin to stay in power in a more, you know, nuanced, uh, less, uh, less uh, direct way. Uh, not because of the constitutional amendments, but as a new leader of this union state, uh, Putin, as we know, has been pushing them for quite some time. Yeah, a Lukashenko, lot of people. Are, a lot of people are going to get lost in that sentence. But even um, as far back as Yeltsin, they were talking about merge Belarus with Russia, have a new constitution, and that's how you get around this two-term limit. Which there is no two-term limit in Russia now, anyway. But that's how you get around the two-term limit because you have a new constitution. Therefore, the the president can sit for another two terms. So what does Putin need that for? He's just got his, he just ran through a referendum where he can stay there to 2036. But the referendum has not been popular among Russians. You know, we need, we know that uh, by, so official, of course, here, uh, they put out the numbers that they wanted to, but unofficially, the uh, electoral statisticians have estimated that uh, it, up to one third of Russians have actually voted against the constitutional amendments. They don't want Putin to stay in, indefinitely. They still think Russia is uh, Europe. It needs to be at least somewhat uh, democratic. So it's, it's a very direct, brutal approach to stay in power that's evident even uh, to Russians as a very, uh, very unclassy manipulation of the electoral legislation. Uh, in this sense, uh, becoming the leader, the head of the union state, however, will provide uh, Putin with more legitimacy. Now Putin can portray himself as a person who, you know, re uh, repairs this uh, historical injustice that's been done to the Soviet Union, sort of recreates this uh, um, uh, big Russian state, play on the imperialistic uh, sentiments of many Russians, and uh, again, uh, leave, uh, stop being the president of Russia, but now become this uh, high level uh, leader. Uh, vacuum, sense, vacuum up the near afar from uh whether it be in Ukraine or whether it be Belarus or, and of course the, the Baltics are, you know, wide eyed and of course urging the EU because they're part of the EU that look, you don't understand Russia very well if you don't get tough with Putin now. So Maria Snegovaya from the Center of European Policy Analysis, I really appreciate your time. And if anybody, you know, you know wants to understand what's going on in Eastern Europe, Maria Snegovaya, I think, is the best read there is. So thank you so much, Maria. Thank you so much, Dan. When I was a correspondent in Russia, I visited a factory in Kazakhstan. That's part of the former Soviet Union. That factory was two football fields long, seven stories high. It produced deadly anthrax. There was another section where the anthrax was blown into nuclear-proof bunkers where SS-18 Satan missiles were loaded with the biological weapon. Missiles pointed at places like New York and L.A. and Washington and London and other capitals. I saw evidence in Uzbekistan where dogs were locked in special cages and used to experiment on with nerve agents. Renaissance Island in the Aral Sea, that's between Uzbekistan and Kazakhstan, was a major testing area for chemical and biological weapons on a huge scale where the Soviets tied horses and monkeys and other animals to posts and exploded bomblets in the middle of the night so no satellites could see their testing program. Biological and chemical weapons are a relic of the past, at least they're supposed to be. If the West fails to get Russia to rein in and reveal its Novichok program, it's a dangerous moment because more will follow. And if COVID-19 hasn't taught us how dangerous a natural outbreak of a virus can be, imagine an attack on the West with something manufactured to kill in much bigger numbers. Horrendous implications for economies and people. Subscribe to Backstory with Dana Lewis. And if you would like to sponsor Backstory, let us know. I'm Dana Lewis. Thanks for listening. And I'll talk to you again soon.